Hope everyone enjoyed the uh, morning panels and presentations. And now we've got our final afternoon. We've got a pretty busy afternoon on tap. We're starting out with the prospect analysis and evaluation panel. And then after a short break, we'll have a panel called Telling Stories in the Age of Sabermetrics, which will be followed by a Bloomberg Sports presentation and then a conference wrap up. So now to start with this panel, this panel will be moderated by Barry Bloom of MLB.com. Barry's been a national reporter for MLB.com since 2002. He has more than 35 years experience covering sports, covered baseball and hockey for five years at Bloomberg Sports, and also spent 16 years as a writer at the San Diego Union Tribune. And I will let Barry introduce the panelists, so I'll turn it over now to Barry. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, I always have to tell this story about Mark. It's now become my staple of uh, Sabre panels, because Mark and I go so far back, we covered the 1984 Padres together, and Mark was a, a kid just coming up in the business, working for the LA Times and I, in the San Diego edition, and I had just been hired to uh, my first baseball beat to cover the Padres in 1982, 83, down in San Diego, the Tribune. And we're on this road trip, and we have this whole game where Gossage is pitching, and he's, he's, he gets thrown out of the game. We have to go talk to Gossage out of the ga after the game. We have to go talk to the umpire. I think it was Bill Bruce Froming. We write our stories. The next day, I'm in the clubhouse, and this is in old Bush Stadium in St. Louis, and uh, all of a sudden, Mark comes running into the clubhouse, white as a sheet, and he goes, I can't believe it. Goose just threw a ball at me. <laughs> True story. He survived, we survived, and here we all are. We've got a great panel here tonight, or this afternoon, where all MLB.comers, uh, it, it, it's some of our best writers, particularly in this particular uh, genre, of uh, prospects, minor leaguers. Uh, to my direct right is uh, Bernie Pleskov, who uh, began with us a couple of years ago, and he's basically in his sort of fourth career iteration. It, 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 it's amazing what he's done, but most recently became a scout, and he was a scout for the Houston Astros and the Seattle Mariners, and then he was writing for Rotowire, and uh, we brought him on to give a scout's perspective to the site and he's just done a tremendous job. Uh, to his right is Jonathan Mayo, and he's the minor league guru. He knows more about the minor leagues than I'll ever hope to know in, in 15 lifetimes. He's been with us. John, you've been there, what, since 2000, since the beginning? Since before advanced media. So before I, the I, beginning. I predate, yeah, since 1999. Okay, so, yeah, so he beat me by a year or two. So that's how far he goes back. And we're really lucky to have Jim Callis, who had over 20 years at Baseball America as an executive editor, managing editor, worked for Stats Inc. Uh, he came on board last year to add his expertise to our site, which is really heavy on, on prospects and their development. And uh, between the three of them, they just do a tremendous job at that part of the site. So I'm going to start this off by throwing this one out. And Bernie, you can start. Uh, the whole system has changed so much in the last five years, 10 years, since you were scouting, really. What do you see as the major changes uh, that have been involved in uh, scouting players at this point? Well, uh, first of all, let me, let me say thank you to Mark and uh, Jacob and Vince from Sabre who do such a fabulous job and I just hope you'll join me in giving them a round of applause for the fabulous job they do. Uh, they're, the, uh, they're the real unsung heroes that put this together. To answer your question, Barry, I think things have changed tremendously. And within even the last five years, and let me go over just a few. One of the most prominent changes that I have seen as a scout, which will affect the metrics is the defensive shift. When you have pull hitters hitting into an infield with a first baseman, a second baseman, a second baseman, and a second baseman, it's gonna be very, very tough to put the ball on the ground through that shift. And I think you're going to see it more prominently. 
I think you're going to see it with heavily, heavily against left-handed hitters, but also against some pull-hitting right-handed hitters. So that's a, that's a big shift. The second shift that I have seen is the massive size of our players, particularly pitchers. If you look at MLB.com and you look at our first round draft choices, the ones that we have selected as the top of the, the cream of the crop, listen to the, I'm just gonna name a few. Archie Bradley, 6'4", 225. John Gray, 6'4", 255. Max Fried, 6'4", 185. Aaron Sanchez, 6'4", 190. Alex Meyer, 6'9", 220. Tyon Walker, 6'4", 230. Noah Syndergaard, 6'6", 240. Jamison Tayon, 6'6", 235. All leading their prospect teams. Now people say to me, Bernie, why are there so many swings and misses? When you have a guy 6'6", throwing downhill, his hand is in your face. It is very, very difficult to follow the ball. That is a major change. And let's not forget that these young men have been playing baseball in high school and traveling teams going all over the country, all over the world, honing their crafts. When I was in high school, I was going out with girls, playing on the sad lot, I wasn't on any traveling teams. That's a huge difference, and both Jonathan and Jim know more about that than I do. Well, also, just to interject, uh, the Yankees have that cut out in their pitchers because, you know, Beyonce, Benuelos, uh, Sabathia, Nova, they're all these big guys who are 6'6 six, six and up, and uh, that's the kind of pitcher that they're, they're, they're picking up right now. See, and, and some teams have an organizational prototype. They will say, look for this prototype. And if it doesn't fit this prototype, look at it, but it's got to be very special. And for example, uh, Stroman with Toronto doesn't fit the, the prototype. He's 5 feet 11, but he throws very well, and I think he's going to be a tremendous success. But he's an outlier. So I think that's something to look for that, that's really, really important. I think replay is going to be a major change. I think runs are going to be taken away and runs are going to be given that had not happened in the past. So I think we're going to see some skewing of runs with replay in place. And the other thing that I think is the biggest difference now because of the size and the lack of power hitting in baseball, and believe me, it is a real lack of power hitting in baseball, that the run the single run is gold, it's precious. That means the return of bunting, that means your fast guys are going to get on base, your Billy Hamilton prototype, your D. Gordon prototype, and as soon as they're on first base, they'll be on second base, they'll move along, it'll be the 59 Chicago White Sox, get them on, get them over, get them in. So that lack of power hitting is a major change, and that return to small ball you'll see at least one to two to three guys per team that run and run well. And of course, there's the catcher interference rule, which I really don't know how that's going to play out. So that's it. Let me uh, add in here, I've forgotten the introductions. I just wanted to add that all of us here have been Sabre members either in the past or the present. Bernie and I are members of the local <coughs> Phoenix chapter. So we're very proud of this organization and what this organization does and the people who are members and the people who run it. Guys down at the other end, uh, you want to add your opinions on what do you think the major changes are, particularly in how you have to cover these things because you know, you've been around it for so long. You want me to go first? Sure. First, I want to say that 1984 was my bar mitzvah year. Just so it shows you. I'm a lot younger than these guys. Just wanted to point that out. Thank you. You're, I'm here for you, Barry. <laughs> Happy Purim, by the way. Yeah. Um, How was the bar mitzvah? Yeah, it was, it was very good. Um, yeah, I think you know more than anything, uh, and I think Jim and I will probably end up kind of tag teaming on this. Uh, the proliferation of information that's out there that everyone has access to is the, really the biggest difference um, since even when I started just doing prospects only, which is about the last 11 years. 
Um, you know, when I first started, it was really Baseball America and not a whole lot else. Uh, these days, you can find any number of publications, websites, blogs, uh, where there's just so much information. And I, and I think it's a two-sided coin. On, you know, on the one hand, it's great. There's a lot more interest. People want to know more about the things that, you know, that we're covering uh, on MLB.com. Uh, the other side of that is that it's out there and it's not, you know, we're not the only source. Well, we think we're the only source or should be the only source, but uh, there's just everybody is covering prospects in some way, shape, or form. So if we bring a player who's an A-ball to somebody's attention, it's not a, wow, I've never heard of that guy. It's more, oh, I heard he threw a curve, not a slider. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, it has changed tremendously. That landscape has changed just because there's so much more uh, information out there that people have access to. Yeah, and I think it's not just an explosion in information. I think it's also the speed with which you can get that information. Uh, you know, I, I know when we unveiled our top uh, 100 prospects list and we did a show with MLB Network, and leading up to that, there was some discussion as to whether Kyle Crick threw a slider or a curve, what he really threw. And while they were doing the show, while they were broadcasting, we had taped it earlier in the day, Kyle Crick tweeted something. And so I actually tweeted right back at him and said, hey, what do you throw, a curve or slider? And he said, actually, both. And that just boggles my mind. I've been covering prospects for 25 years. And when I started, there was no internet. Uh, there were, maybe I guess there were cell phones. Very few people had them. Uh, it was somewhat hard to get information even from teams, just to either track down scouts. And, and back then, I think the teams and scouts guarded information, you know, breaking down a guy's tools, what kind of pitches a guy throws. A lot, held that information a lot more tightly than they do today. I, I think, again, because that information's out there, it's accessible. Um, there, there's video. Now, when, when I started, the only way you got to really see a prospect was if you went to the game. And, you know, we were in, when I worked with Baseball America, we were in Durham, North Carolina. When I started, we had a really small travel budget, so it wasn't like we were crisscrossing all over the country seeing guys. Now, there's, there's games on TV, on Internet TV. Uh, there, there's clips posted on YouTube. Uh, you know, at MLB.com, you know, we have... We're in the process of unveiling 30 top 20 prospect lists, one for each team, that's 600 guys. And we don't have video of all of those guys. Some guys, we just have pictures, but we have video of the vast majority of them. No. So instead of wondering, what do the guys' mechanics look like? What's the swing look like? You can actually see that. You, can, you have fans or, or you know, bloggers. You can post that stuff on the internet, on YouTube. And so there's just that much more information. Statist minor league statistics weren't available really Either back when I started, Baseball America, we printed them in the magazine, and we came out every two weeks, and that was pretty much the only source you had for getting minor league statistics, unless maybe you, you lived in a minor league city, you might get the local league statistics. Now, you can go on, on our site, you can go on Baseball Reference, you can go on Baseball America, I'm probably forgetting a couple. Um, I guess fan graphs too, there, there's minor league stats all over the place with some detailed breakdowns, there's lefty-righty splits, it's home away. Um, it, it's just amazing to me how much more information is out there and how quickly you can get your hands on it compared to when I, when I started in the business. And I think you know, what that means for, for the general fan is that it used to be a guy would get to the big leagues and you, everyone was seeing him for the first time. Uh, now they get to the big leagues and uh, you know him exceptionally well. Uh, and I know there are some you know, farm directors and executives who aren't thrilled with that. I was in a camp once and the guy's like, 25 years ago, I didn't have to talk to anybody about these guys, and I would prefer to keep it that way because sometimes they then have this sense of entitlement. It's when you see these young prospects come up and they think they've got it all figured out, and then they fall flat on their faces and they don't know what to do with themselves. Uh, so that, uh, that's the, maybe the downside from a team perspective, but nowadays a guy gets to the big leagues, and you already know really all about you know, what Jim laid out, you know, from his swing mechanics to his stuff to his scouting report to his biographical information. It's all known information. Well, let me uh, peel something off that Bernie uh, alluded to. We have been having some discussion about this during the conference. Are we good about this thing with the shifts? I mean, it started with Ted Williams. It, 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 it came to really a height with Barry Bonds when they were trying to do anything they could. And Barry was such a good hitter, he just hit it the other way. But they were glad to have Barry hit a double down the third first base uh, third base line, rather than hit a home run. Do we want to see David Ortiz 
hit the ball into a shift or over it, or do we want to keep players in their defensive positions so that the game is fair and that the offense and the defense is balanced? I'm opening it up to any of you guys. Well, from my perspective, you want to get that guy out. And the way you're going to get him out is to use the defensive metrics that you see. And what you see is Adam Dunn can hit the ball to the right side of the field. And he's going to be up there all day trying to hit the ball to the left side of the field. So if I have Adam Dunn up there, if I'm not going to strike him out, I want him to hit the ball on the ground. The last thing I want him to do is hit the ball in the air. So I'm going to keep the ball down, I'm going to sink the ball, and try to get him to hit it on the ground, and I'm going to throw him nothing but breaking balls. So from my perspective, the Joe Maddens of the world who have instituted these shifts have been brilliant. And uh, th this past spring, uh, Williams in uh, Washington put on su such a shift that he had two first basemen. So you, you're going to see more and more of it. This isn't going away. And it is ex especially true on extreme pull hitters. Jonathan and uh, um, You know, I, I think the, I agree with you in general. I mean, it, it, the idea is to get hitters out. Otherwise, you just throw fastballs down the middle, you know, and have it be batting practice. But I, I think the danger that you can run into is that because there's so much more statistical information and you have maybe, th you know, you have guys – stuff from college, his minor league numbers, uh, and that all creates a, a certain profile for a guy that they sometimes can be pigeonholed into that guy. Now, it's up to that guy once they get to that level to outperform what that profile is. I just remember uh, when I was much younger when uh, Paul O'Neill first came up with the Cincinnati Reds, and he already had a reputation. Now, we didn't have that information because we didn't it's not like now, but if Paul O'Neill came up now and there was all this information about how he couldn't hit left-handed pitching at all, he came up and he was immediately put into a profile situation in Cincinnati when he was I don't know, 23, however old he was when he came up. And then he went on to show that, yes, he wasn't great against left-handed pitching when he got to New York, but he was good enough to be an everyday right fielder. And I think the one danger with all of this information, uh, this uh, portfolio that, that, that gets built from their now from their amateur days all the way up is, is that there has to be some allowance for these guys uh, to outgrow and make adjustments uh, what that profile says. Hey, Jim, uh, do, what is the the most important statistical uh, numbers you use to evaluate players? Well, when we're looking at prospects, I guess probably if I had to pick just one, I'd say strikeout to walk ratio is the one I look at a lot for both pitchers and hitters. For pitchers, it'll give you a sense as to, you know, you'll, you'll read about guys all the time who throw 95 miles an hour but maybe don't strike out a lot of guys, and that's a red flag. Or, you know, if, if a guy's got good stuff but he doesn't have a good strikeout to walk ratio, then that stuff, for whatever reason, isn't as effective as maybe it should be. And for hitters, you can have guys in the minor leagues – who, who put up big numbers, but maybe they're striking out four or five times as much as they walk, which is a red flag that maybe they aren't going to do at the higher level. You know, the, the, the interesting thing, I, I think, with statistics and prospect evaluation is, again, th they're so much more readily available than they were, you know, even, you know, 15 years ago. And, and I'll get emails or, or tweets or, for, thankfully, not phone calls from fans saying, you know, hey, you know, for instance, Andrew Lambeau's having this great year. Why don't you like him more? You know, his numbers are terrific. And, and you know, the thing is, it's, it's a balance between statistics and tools, especially at the lower levels of the minors. I think the, more, the higher you rise up in the minor league system, the more weight you could put on statistics. But the lower ends of the minors, you know, one example, in, in, in A ball, especially in low class A, if you are a pitcher and you can throw your fat, you can locate your fastball where you want it. It doesn't have to be a big fastball and you can maybe command a second pitch and throw it for strikes, like a breaking ball or change ball, whatever, those guys tend to carve up low-class A hitters but often get exposed when they get to higher levels because their stuff isn't that good, but they, they can command the strike zone and the hitters can't that level. Or you'll see sometimes, you know, I was just talking about strikeouts and walks. I remember a few years ago, at least it was more than a few, talking to the Red Sox and Ben Charrington, who was the farm director at that point, about Tony Blanco, who was a, one of their better prospects. The system wasn't nearly as strong as it was now. And I think Tony Blanco had set a Gulf Coast League home run record, um, which is the lowest level of, of the U.S. minor league system in the Gulf Coast League and Arizona League. And I asked him, I, I 
can't remember his walk total, but I said, you know, it looks like two Tony Blanco's got really good play discipline. He walked, you know, something like 35 times in 66 games. And, and Ben Sherrington said, you know, he really doesn't have good play discipline. But that level, the pitchers can't, you know, if they want to pitch around him, they're not missing the plate by, you know, three inches or six inches of getting him to chase. When they try to pitch around him, they're bouncing balls in the dirt or they're throwing it a foot outside the strike zone. And he's basically just not swinging the pitches that are obvious balls, but it really doesn't speak to his strike zone discipline. So, you know, statistics are part of the picture, but, but so are the, the, the tools and the, and the mental makeup. Um, and it's, you know, like I said, it, it's interesting that there's so much more readily available and you can have them, you know, I could call them up on my smartphone right now. I could look up somebody's minor league stats if I wanted. Um, but they're not the complete picture. You have to take the context into account. And, and probably the, the most important part of that context is, is the player's age relative to his league. I'm a lot more excited about a 19 or, or 20 year old kid performing well in high class A than I am about a 22 year old kid who might be tearing up the, the Midwest League or the South Atlantic League when they're, they're three years older than, than the optimal age for that league. See, and as a scout, I'm taught really not to look at statistics at all, but to look at mechanics. And as a matter of fact, I was taught that not only with my eyes, but my ears. When a player comes to the plate, close your eyes and listen to the ball off the bat. So it's not all stats, it's how he goes about his business. It's his mechanics that make him the player. So if you take, and, and you know, not everybody likes chocolate or vanilla, and that's why they have chocolate and vanilla. What I like in a player is not gonna be the same as uh, Jonathan or Jim, and that's why everybody's different. So you take those statistics, and you take what people like me observe, and you put them together, and you blend them together, and then you have a player. It's not all statistics, and it's not all mechanics. That's really important. John, isn't it your position that all this information has made it harder to evaluate players to do your job? Well, I, I think it is because, you know, you know, I think Jim used the Andrew Lamb. I don't know why you got to hate on the Pirates, by the way. That's all I'm going to call for. But, um, <laughs> uh, but uh, that, you know, with a player like that, uh, it does make it more difficult because uh, everyone has an opinion um, now, which is fine. I mean, you know, it's, I think it's just part and parcel with what, what we try to do now. But it does make it more difficult because people will be certain of what they've seen or read or analyzed if they're looking at statistics. And you can really dig down deep now. You could see what a guy hits with two strikes in the minor leagues. I mean, things like that that weren't imaginable just a few short years ago. So they feel that they have a complete picture of every single player. So if you throw something out there or you rank a guy lower than they think he should be ranked based on this huge wealth of information that they have, uh, it, you, you can't talk them off that, that ledge and it becomes a, you know, he said, he said, or he said, she said kind of thing where it's, well, you know, this is what we think and then they'll tell us that we're wrong and that's pretty much the end of the conversation but there's no real budging because there is this, uh, there is often a sense that because they can look at stats, they can even if they want watch video uh, so they can try to combine the two things and, uh, and form their, their own opinions. Uh, Bernie, when when you were a scout, what did you look at when you evaluated a player? Well, there's several things, and I'm going to go over this very quickly. Um, the first, and, and I go by what I was taught and my mentors. My mentor is now 92 years old. He's a scout for the uh, Seattle Mariners, uh, Bill Kearns. You may know the name. You know, there's several things. First of all, can he play? And, you know, we, we sit here and we say every major league player can play. They can't all play. Secondly, I mean, they, they don't all have agility. They don't all have athletic ability. They don't all have flowing motion. Uh, they don't all play the same way. Second thing is, does he want to play? And I think that's probably the biggest question I look at. I want a guy on my team who wants to be there. And that's very obvious by the way he hustles, his heart, his soul. There are guys that have walked out to center field. I remember one very vividly. I would never want that on my team. The third thing is, can he play for us? And the fourth thing is, can we put him in our clubhouse? So those are the things that I look for. Now, if you're looking at a pitcher, you, you have grades, and I don't want to go into all of those things. 
If you hit 35 or more home runs, you're an eight or an 80, and those are all-star players. If you can run 4.3 to first base, that's major league average. I saw two three nines yesterday, but for me, 4.3 is passe. These guys are running 4.5 as an average. So when I see a 3.9 by a Hamilton, that's, that's stellar. So there's lots of things you look for, but for me, it's can he play, does he want to play, and what's his heart like? And the most important thing, what are the observable tools? What do I see of the five tools that will take him to the next level? And can he develop his third tool to a fourth tool to a fifth tool. That's it in a nutshell. And I think, you know, going down to the, to the amateur level, because Jim and I spend a lot of time covering the, the draft, what's happened, uh, you know, especially in places like, like here, is that, you know, kids, they play baseball all year round, and that's all they do. And they play and play and play and play and play. And frankly, I actually, I, I, I'm not a fan of this. Um, and I have seen many players who they play at the highest high school level uh, and they attend all these showcases and they are phenomenal to watch taking batting practice. You watch them in the outfield and they have these absolute guns and eyes light up, people are excited and then they play a game and they haven't the slightest idea how to play baseball. They're showcase players, you know, practice players when, you know, when you were kids but they just, you know, they, they're like robots and they don't have that feel for the game so often. Now, sometimes, eventually, that, that can come, and if they have tremendous physical gifts, they can become big leaguers. But I have seen uh, more and more, as people have become so specialized, that uh, you see these kids who really don't have that feel for the game, that, you know, that Bernie, Bernie's not the only scout who would say that, that don't have that feel for the game. I think one of the positives about the the, the showcase circuit, and there are some negatives, but one of the positives about it is, for, for doing our job, is, is you get a much better sense of how guys perform against top competition. I mean, you talk to scouts, and, and 20 years ago, before you, you, know, you had the Area Code Games and East Coast Pro Showcase and the you know, Under Armour All-America Classic and the Perfect Game All-America Game and the Perfect Game World Wood Bat, the Championships in Jupiter and the National Showcase and on and on and on, you know, there might be a all over the country, a good high school player, and, you know, you're trying to get a sense of how good he really is. You know, you might be interested in a high school pitcher, and he might face, if you're lucky, one or two hitters in his area who are pro-caliber hitters at that level. You, you, you're, like, for instance, this year, I'll give you a perfect example. Probably the best high school pitcher in the draft this year is a kid named Tyler Kolick, who's from Shepherd High School in Texas. It's about an hour away from Houston. Well, Shepherd is a 2A high school, which is the second lowest classification in Texas. I think his graduating class probably got under 100 people in it. And, and, and Tyler Kolick, you know, he's, he's raw, but he can throw, you know, he'll, he'll top 100 miles an hour in the radar gun against kids who have no, you know, he can bounce a ball in the dirt. And, they, they, you know, to even catch up to it, they've got to start their swing before the ball's probably out of his hand. So he doesn't even have to, you, you get no gauge as to what he's like against top competition. And, and the good thing about these showcases, what scouts will tell you, is that when you have guys run the showcase circuit in the summer and early fall, you get to see them against all the top competition. And, you know, it's not necessarily always good for the player. They may get exposed a little bit. I mean, Kolick has not commanded the strike zone as well in those events as he, as he does, you know, just simply overmatching two-way hitters. And, you know, and there's probably one of the best athletes in this year's draft hasn't hit at all at these showcase circuits, which, which makes people wonder about the quality of his bat. So when I was talking earlier about how there's a proliferation of information, you know, not, it's not just statistical. Because of these showcases, because you have so many summer leagues and all those statistics are out there, and some of those games are even televised, college summer leagues, that is, even at the amateur level, guys are playing so much more, and the cream of the crop's playing against the cream of the crop. There, there's even more scouting and tools information than there was on these guys 15 or 20 years ago. Um, which is great from the standpoint of there's that much more to evaluate the player on, but it also, you can get buried under the mountain of data sometimes as well. There's, there's three guys I want to talk about that I remember from seeing them instantly. Alcides Escobar, the first, first time I saw him was in the Arizona Fall League. The ball disappeared in his glove. I sat up in my seat and I was with two colleagues who worked for different organizations. We all shook our, our heads and said, this is special. Another one was Salvador Perez. Unbelievable receiving skills with a bat for a catcher. 
So I say to myself, these guys can't miss. And the third guy was very recently, and that was Didi Gregorius, the most athletic guy I saw in the Arizona Fall League two years ago. An, an absolute magician at shortstop. One of the best defensive shortstops I have seen in 10 years. But now we've got a group of six or seven or eight shortstops who are equal to Gregarious, and that's what you're seeing. You're seeing these defensive wizards who are gonna have to hit to stay. But the talent is amazing. Let's talk about the people that you've seen and the players you've seen this spring. Uh, Jim, I know you're just starting your run around uh, Major League Baseball camps, but you follow it from afar and you've been doing top 20 lists. Who are your favorites and who, do you, who, are, who are not? Well, yeah, you know, it's like, like you noted, it's, uh, tomorrow's actually my first day in big league camps. So I haven't seen anybody up front, but I mean, if you're talking about the minor leagues as a whole, I mean, I, I think that, and this isn't going to come as a shock game, but I mean, the guy, and he's not here, so I won't get to see him out here, but the, I don't think there's any question the most exciting prospect in baseball right now is Byron Buxton, who, uh, you know, you, you're talking about the two-day scouting scale. His, his worst tool is probably his power, which is at least above average, and it's probably 25 home runs a year, and, you know, yeah, I've used this line a million times, but I mean, he's essentially, you, know, you compare him to Mike Trout, was kind of the last guy who had this kind of exciting all-around tool package, and what people forget is when Mike Trout was the same age, there's a little question about his power. There, there were guys when, when Trout was in Class A who thought, ah, this guy's only going to be a 15 to home run guy, although I mean, everything else he does you know, very well, and he's going to hit, and he's going to be a tremendous defender, and he can really run. Um, so, so Buxton, I'm not saying he's going to be better than Mike Trout, because Mike Trout just probably had the best 20-year-old season and 21-year-old season or you could at least argue it that any major leaguers ever had, but uh, but he he'd be the the guy who I think is I think the consensus number one prospect for everybody right now. John, I was going to say Buxton. Um, Same it's again. no, it's it's hard not to get excited by him. I'm trying to think. I ran around Florida for for about seven or eight days, and uh, um, I saw I missed Noah Syndergaard by a day. He actually didn't throw very well that day, but. Um, Bernie was ticking off his size. He's every inch of, I mean, these guys come into camp now. Uh, the, those days, you know, uh, when people would come to camp to get into shape are long gone. And Noah Syndergaard is a, it was a machine. I mean, he was just was unbelievable. Um, I kind of liked seeing some of these guys uh, in big league camp who kind of uh, were under the radar. You know, Mets camp, uh, when I was there, Stephen Mates threw, and he's a lefty that was their top pick in 2011. Might be even before that. He's been hurt. Yeah. He missed like close to two years, and he came back last year, made it through a season healthy, uh, and looked very good. And, you know, the Mets have some some exciting pitching with Syndergaard and Rafael Montero, um, and Mates uh, is a guy that you know sort of keep on your your radar screen. And then I'll just throw one other guy out there just because it was, it was sort of fun to see. The Tigers have this really raw, toolsy player named Stephen Moya. Uh, he's also an immense human being. And uh, he <laughs> missed... Uh, no, I think he's 6'6". Six, six. Yeah, um, he is. And uh, there's a lot of swing and miss. He missed last year for, for uh, Tommy John surgery, but he, uh, he made it back. And he's in big league camp, and it was actually... Um, my choice for a breakout candidate for our spring training report based on conversations I have with the Tigers. It's not often when you're watching batting practice on a big league field in spring training and the coaching staff behind the cage is, is laughing, like audibly giggling because they're watching this guy take batting practice. It was that impressive. And he, uh, Lakeland, where the, the Tigers have spring training, it, it's not like a particularly good place for hitters to hit. Uh, the Florida State League in general is terrible. He hit a ball. They have light towers behind the fences, a good, I don't know, 50 feet at least behind the fences. Right center field, three quarters of the way up the light tower, bounced two off of the light tower. Like, it's the kind of thing where other players stop what they're doing and look it up. Now, will he hit enough to tap into that power? That's the, the big question, but I'm looking forward to, to finding out. You know, I'm going to give you several that I saw in Florida, and of course I've seen all the Cubs here, and we've talked about all the Cubs infinitum, so I don't want to talk about the Cubs because I think everybody knows about them. There's a pitcher for the Cardinals, left-handed pitcher named Tom Cooney. I want you to remember that name. As if the Cardinals don't have enough pitching, this guy is unbelievable. Tom Cooney. Uh, the best player I saw in Florida, bar none, was Carlos Correa, the... Um, 
Houston Astros shortstop, who I think could outgrow shortstop, but this guy is a, like a six-tool player with his six-tool being his heart. He is a terrific ball player. I did see Syndergaard's bad start, um, and Noah Syndergaard is going to be a monster on the mound. He had a bad start because he couldn't command his fastball. And the reason he didn't command his fastball is because when you're throwing, you have to shake hands with the catcher. And when you stop short, the ball's going to elevate, and he got hit. Whenever you see a, a pitcher not finishing his pitches, he's going to get hit. Or if he falls off the mound, Syndergaard had a bad day. A couple other names to remember. Jonathan Scope. I think is going to be at second base for Baltimore before the season is out. He has improved tremendously since I've seen him. He is a barrel of the bat hitter now. Baltimore Orioles offense is incredible. The Baltimore Orioles offense is incredible. One through nine. Um, Henry, Uredia, Henry Uredia, the left-handed designated hitter, and, and the guy who had the best spring that I saw game after game after game was Nick Markakis. He gained 40 pounds, upper body strength. He looked awesome to me. A lot of good guys out there, so I also saw Stephen Mates, and he's on my list. That's funny. So uh, I think it's going to be a fantastic season. These next 10 days, I will be, I will be here in Phoenix watching uh, the Phoenix spring training. Well, I know you didn't want to talk about the Cubs, but I have to ask is among all these kids that they're projecting out over the next few years, is Baez the best of them? Yes. And Chris Bryant is 1A. Chris Bryant hits the longest home runs I've ever seen, the highest. He's also going to strike out a lot, and I don't think he's going to end up at third base. I think he's going to be a right fielder. Uh, as I see it happening, um, Baez is going to be their shortstop. Um, somebody's going to play second. It could be Alcantara. Uh, Almora is fabulous in center field. Von de Bosch at first base. They've got it all. I mean, their position players are going to be stellar. I'd like to hear what my colleagues have to say, but there isn't one of them. Uh, I think there might be one who's an outlier, uh, but the rest of Soler might be a little bit Question behind mark. the rest of them. A little bit, there's a more of a question mark. Yeah, and I, I think it's that. conditioning, Jonathan. I think if he stays in, in shape right. and gets in shape, he'll be okay. And, and, and effort. I mean, that's the one yeah, thing that's been called that, into that's question right. with him. Um, yeah, they're pretty good. I mean, not only does Brian hit the, the, you know, those majestic shots, but he, he, his power is all, to all fields. Um, and it, it's, his ability to hit the ball out the other way is – Unbelievable, especially given his setup at the plate. I think it doesn't look like he should be able to do it, and yet he does. Um, I'm not sure that Baez ends up at short, but you know that's you know some of that may be personnel-wise, and some of that might be you yeah. know dependent on what they what they want to do with him. But I still like the idea of moving him to third and yeah. Bryant to right field. Yeah. Um, but I was in Cubs camp yesterday, and I think he's actually going to see more time at second uh, in the mi once he goes back down to the minors, just so he can be ready to play there should the need arise. Um, it would be a waste of a, what's a very good throwing arm, but I think all those guys are, are, are legitimate. Uh, the only thing that'll come into question is, you know, is, is their pitching and they don't have as much of that in the system. So Jim, uh, uh, for Cub fans who are wringing, wringing their hands because the team hasn't won a World Series since 1908, how far is this team away as you pick apart what they're doing with their minor league system? Well, I think they're doing the right things. I mean, you, I think they're going to be good, and I think they're going to be a playoff team in, in the near future. You know, what happens when you get to three rounds of playoffs? There's, there's some luck involved, too. So I'm not going to go out on a limb and say they're going to win the World Series in 2018, but I think they will contend. And, and I'm actually bullish on some of their pitchers, too. I, I think C.G. Edwards has won the most electric fastballs in the minor leagues. I think Pierce Johnson's a guy who gets overlooked a little bit, but I, I think those are two guys who could pitch at the front of their rotation. A couple years down the road, uh, I think the initial reports on Aradis Vizcaino are very positive after he's missed the last two years uh, with, with Tommy John surgery and then a, a follow-up surgery to clean up some scar tissue. It wouldn't surprise me at all if Vizcaino is closing for them by midseason. They, they, do, they do have more impressive hitters and pitchers, but their pitchers are coming, um, and I think they've done a lot of fine work kind of rebuilding that system the last couple of years. And, I, and I'll give them credit because you know, they, they had a choice in last year's draft. You know, they were picking number two overall, 
Uh, and everyone knew that they needed pitching, and they had Al Mora and Baez from the previous two drafts, and they felt that Chris Bryant was the best player on the board, regardless of what they had in their organization, so they took him instead of John Gray, and uh, who, you know, who's the other <coughs> real alternative. And, and, you know, whether you agree that they should have, you know, who they should have taken, the fact that they stuck with the guy that they felt was the best player, regardless, uh, and the fact of the matter is that Guys who can hit 40 homers, uh, you know, and drive in 100 plus every year don't grow on trees. And uh, I think you know, Baez and, and Bryant combined should hit 70, 70 homers a year, and that should start happening you know in the not too distant future. And I just want to throw a yellow light up here, and we're talking about prospects. We are not talking about guys that have done it yet. We are not talking guys who have hit the major league slider yet which is the great separator. The slider, the breaking ball, separates a great prospect from a great major league player. We talked last night about the Kansas City Royals pitching. Remember how the Royals were going to throw five starters at you by last year. A lot of them lefties, a couple righties. They were going to be phenomenal. Not one of them made it to the big leagues as a star. So be careful when you think about all these fabulous prospects. But this Cubs crop is above, above them all. Uh, before we go to questions, there's one thing I'd like to ask you, and to that point, Bernie, is as a scout, what was your biggest find and what was your biggest bust? Well, you know, I never had to – I was never an amateur scout. I was always a professional scout. So my recommendations were all on players who were – in the big leagues. My biggest disappointment was when I was with the Mariners and we traded for Eric Bedard. That was a heartbreak for me. And the reason it was a heartbreak for me was because I was a Chris Tillman fan. And Chris Tillman, I felt five years ago, was going to be the future of our club on the mound. You know, all the other players in the deal were important, but for me, Chris Tillman was the guy. So we all screamed, we all hollered. But the general manager felt we are Eric Bedard away from the World Series. Well, as you know, Eric Bedard did not pitch well, got hurt, got a pain in the butt, could not pitch under pressure at that time, and the general manager lost his job. So that's one quick story because I didn't go out finding uh, amateur players. But it, it illustrates exactly what you were talking about. You can make all the evaluations in the world that you want, and eventually, most of these prospects don't play themselves out, do they? 10% of the kids in the minor leagues make it to the major leagues. Of those 10%, some of them are stars, some of them are not. You have to stock your minor league clubs so that the good players have players to play against. In the Arizona League, if you go out to the Arizona League, you'll see tons and tons of players that you'll never, ever see again. That's because they're given a chance to, to prove themselves, and if they don't, they'll fall by the wayside. I'd, I'd like to take Matt, the last... Matt Laporta. I'd like to take the last 15 minutes to... Uh, you guys, For if you have any questions to ask, uh, please uh, do. You've got a wealth of knowledge here to tap. Hey, I just wanted to hear your opinion on someone you think uh, is a sleeper in terms of prospect valuation, either someone who... Uh, is highly valued and you still think they're undervalued or someone who maybe was on the fringe of top 100 prospect and you think they'll be able to make the jump this year? Two guys who jump out for me, actually both pitch for the Royals. You know, one of whom is Sean Manaya, who would have been a very high draft pick last year but had hip issues which turned into shoulder issues and he never really showed the stuff he'd shown the summer before. And he went in the, in the supplemental first round. And he didn't make our top 100 prospect list. I think both Jonathan and I liked him a lot, kind of want to see him healthy for an extended period of time before we put him on the top 100 prospect list, but I think he's a guy who could definitely do that. And another guy who's in that system, he's got a very good arm, and he gets overshadowed, I think, because he, he was in, in Class A last year, is Miguel Almonte, um, is a right-hander who's got a very good arm. And those were the first two guys I thought of when you said guys who, who maybe can make the top 100 this year who just missed. I think they both were kind of in the running, um, and I, I think they're both going to be, it could be pretty high up on the top 100 next year. I'll, I'll throw out two more, and um, 
I don't know if I can speak for Jim necessarily, but you know, we each split up our team, you know, the, the team top 20s that we're doing. So those are the guys who are kind of fresher uh, in my mind right now. Uh, one is uh, Jorge Polanco of the Minnesota Twins. Uh, he's, a, he's played both second and short, but he's really a second baseman. He can really hit, and I think he's going to hit his way to the big leagues and be a, a, a really, you know, he'll be actually a, a decent defender at second, but uh, he's going to be a good everyday hitter. And then I think I will go to the Pirates list and go uh, with a guy who got a lot of attention early just because of the amount of money he got to sign out of Mexico, and that's Luis Heredia. And then he showed up last spring um, with uh, a me medical condition called being fat. Hmm. He, uh, he just was horrifically out of shape and threw like he was really out of shape and his velocity backed up and he just was not the guy who had looked so sharp. He's really, really young. And uh, he came to camp this year. He finally bought into the conditioning and he's in really good shape. And uh, I think he needs to go out now and show that he is the guy that he was a couple of years ago when he was first starting out. But I think he's a guy who can make a big leap forward. I'm going to give you two names that uh, one of them is not a prospect. He's been around, but he hasn't played. His name is Mark Kraus. Uh, he was traded by the Diamondbacks to the uh, Houston Astros. The guy will platoon against left-handed pitching, and he can hit. The other one is Jesus Aguilar of the uh, Cleveland Indians, first baseman who I think will be up in the last third of the season because they will want his power. Those are the two guys. Aguilar is a prospect. Let me interject. Uh, what do you guys think of Gregory uh, Blanco? Polanco? Yeah, Polanco, Polanco. The, uh, of the Pirates. Huge. And whether or not he's going to make the team or not. I don't know that he'll make the team he coming out of team. spring training, but you'll see him at some point. He's, he's the real deal. Yeah, they, he won't make the team out of spring training for a host of reasons, but uh, I could see him by midseason and uh, – that would give the Pirates three center fielders defensively, so a, a ball is never going to drop uh, in, in that outfield. But uh, he is legitimate. And talk about a guy who is um, – you see him up close. He's big. He's, he's a, another big dude, 6'5", um, and just unbelievably athletic. Like yeah, yeah. Uh, Bernie said that he saw two 3'9s the other day. Who were the others? Uh, D. Gordon. D. Gordon and Billy Hamilton, 3'9". Gordon may have been 3-8. It may have been a tad late. It was on a bunt. No chance. I saw Gordon steal second on the throwback to the pitcher, by the way. That's what you're talking about. Uh, as a Pirates fan, I like to hear all this uh, talk about our prospects. And uh, being only 22 years old, I've been used to uh, us having around the number one pick, which is usually pretty straightforward. Um, but now we have like the number 27 pick, I think. So are there any uh, like kind of sleeper draft prospects you see maybe falling to the Pirates who could have top five impact? Jim, you figured out the first round already, <laughs> haven't you? Yeah, I mean, it's just it's way too early to really know who's going to go that low in the draft. And in terms of guys falling, I mean, I don't know if there's a guy who's, who came into the year as maybe a top 10 overall pick who, who's fallen that far. I mean, there's guys like – there's questions about Jacob Gatewood's bat and Tuki Toussaint's control and maybe Michael Geddes's bat. But I don't think any of those guys are going to last that long. It's just when, you, when you're picking – I mean, the good news if you're a Pirates fan and they're picking 27 is I'm sure the Pirates are going to get somebody who's probably 15th or something on their draft board or, or right around 15th on their draft board. But if you ask the Pirates that question, they'll probably tell you the same thing, but they'll say – we don't know who that guy's going to be yet. You, know, you just don't know until the teams take the guy. So when you're picking the bottom of the first round, you usually get a player you have ranked higher than your draft slot. But at this point, it's too early to say this specific guy's falling, could fall in their lap. We don't even really know much about signability of guys yet. But um, the nice thing is they're picking 27th instead of second or third this year. And, and, you know, and one of the things that's changed is with the new draft rules is that a guy's not going to fall to them that they can then spend money on. Well, they can, but that would – blow up their entire draft you know, because they're, they're much more limited. I will say that uh, this class from what we've been able to see so far is fairly deep in high school pitching uh, and they have shown that they do like high school pitchers uh, at least you know in, in the past when they were really aggressive in the draft so if they decide they want to go that route there might be a, a pretty good one that's uh, around for them you know, at, at 27. 
Um, speaking of fast players, we talked about a minute ago. Curious your thoughts on Anthony Ghost. I know he's maybe no longer an officially a prospect. I think he can be a pretty exciting major league player, but contact issues at the plate is how I see him. What, what's your take on Anthony Ghost? <laughs> Funny thing about Anthony Ghost, talking about a uh, center fielder, came up to me the first time I ever saw him in the fall league, and he said, I want you to remember me. I'm going to be the best defensive outfielder you've ever seen in your life. And, you know, I said to myself, well, you know, that's chutzpah. Uh, but he isn't. <laughs> uh, the fastest guy I ever saw in my life was Mickey Mantle, and then I saw Ichiro. Uh, Ichiro was uh, unbelievable. 3-5, three, 3-6. Three, Deion Sanders was the one for me. I mean, when he came up in the Yankee system, I was in Columbus at a minor league game. And he had a ball in the gap on the ground to the fence and had a stand up uh, in, inside the park home run. And w even when he was with the Braves in Atlanta, uh, they were in San Diego and he hit the ball off the fence in right center at the old ballpark in Mission Valley. And by the time it hit the fence, I looked and he was standing on second base. So there, I've never seen anybody faster than him in baseball. But you gotta, you got to be able to make contact, and that's the biggest problem with him. I mean, his strikeout rates have always been, even in the minors when he put up good numbers, and uh, I want them to put him back on the mound. He was like 96, 97, left-handed in high school, but he had no interest in pitching. Um, but I would love to see that because, you know, maybe he's a fourth outfielder, uh, and he is, a ter he is a terrific defensive outfielder, but, you know, especially for a guy who's a speed guy, it, it, if your contact rate is that low, it's awfully hard f for that to balance out. Over here, uh, Barry. Um, got a question. Uh, Taiwan Walker or Dylan Bundy, and what's the case for either being the better of the two? <laughs> I know it's splitting hairs, but who, who, do you, who do you really love of those two? And they're both healthy? Yeah. We're, we're assuming health? Yeah. I'll take Walker, uh, I, I, but only by a little bit. And I would actually take Dylan Bundy. I think he's got a better breaking ball. That would be the separator for me. I think they both have quality fastballs if they're healthy. They both have you know, good change-ups, but I think the separator is Dylan Bundy's got better breaking ball and more feel for pitching. And I'm with Walker because of the park he'll be pitching in. I think park effects are tremendous, and I think his numbers will benefit by that when he gets healthy. Yeah, but who are you taking in a neutral park, Bernie? In a neutral park, uh, I'll still take Walker by a tad. I heard somebody yell out Bo Jackson over here. Yeah, Bo Jackson was a tremendous player, but he was a running back. And uh, I think uh, Dion really was a free safety most of his football career. Uh, they were completely different body types. And I think from my naked eye that Sanders was faster. You know, today with video and the way you'd break it down, I, they could probably tell you who was and who wasn't but they didn't have that back then. Hi, I was just wondering why um, DJ Peterson was not on high as on the prospect list as he should be since I thought he was a really good hitter. How high should he be? <laughs> on the top. <laughs> I, I think I actually voted, uh, I think I had DJ Peterson higher than you do. I, I don't disagree with you. I think DJ Peterson might be the best all around college hitter from last year's draft. Um, came out, had a great pro debut. I, I think the knock on him is that he might not offer very much defensive value at all. I don't really think he's a guy who's going to stick at third base. If he does, I think he's going to be a below average third baseman who's going to have a tremendous bat. His numbers will be mitigated by Safeco Field as well. But I think when you're looking, in terms of his bat, I think his values is as much as, you know, he has one of the best potential bats in the minor leagues. But when you're looking at the, at the whole picture, the lack of defensive value and athleticism brings him down just a little bit. Right. Once he moves over to first, then he's you know, there's a certain profile that's expected. Uh, and I don't know that he, he's going to hit. I like him too. I mean, he is on the top 100. But uh, I think that he may not have the power profile that you want. And he's, you know, below average runner, easily below average runner. So it, that limits, I think, you know, his ceiling on, on, on the kinds of lists that, that Jim and I put together. Hey, Jim and uh, Jonathan, how do you account for positional scarcity as it currently exists in the major leagues when you're ranking prospects? One of the bigger differences I've noticed between top 100 lists is that some people place a lot of emphasis on shortstops right now, maybe because the major league shortstop is a little weak compared to previous eras. Do you adjust for that at all? I think that we have a lot of shortstops on our list because there are a lot of good shortstops. 
I mean, and that for me, that's it. I don't actually really think about it that all, you know, that much at all. Now, if a guy plays a position where there aren't a lot, you know, say catcher, uh, and he can catch, then that might have some some value. I mean, we had a lot of discussions about Reese McGuire of the Pirates as being in that next wave. He didn't make the top 100 list, but he was close. The fact that he can catch and will catch every day. Uh, certainly adds to his value, but for me anyway, it's not because there aren't a lot of catchers. If that were the case, we'd have to put a lot more first basemen. Uh, if you look at our top 10 first baseman list, it's terrible. Um, you know, so uh, for me, that doesn't, that doesn't enter into the equation much. I guess I was interpreting your question a little bit different way. I, I think you have to look at the position when you're evaluating these guys. But what Jonathan said about the shortstops, I think the reason you have you know, Bogarts and Correa and Baez, and Addison Russell, Lindor. Uh, Lindor, at the top of all these lists, is those guys are very, very talented prospects. But I think, you know, like I was just saying with DJ Peterson, you have to take into account not just the offensive value, but the defensive value. And if DJ Peterson's only a first baseman, which is how I'm seeing him, I'm not going to rank him as high as whether I, I see him as a third baseman. You know, likewise, you know, we, 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 we almost put Reese McGuire on our top 100 because we, you know, it's hard to find good catchers. Um, the first base prospect, if there aren't a lot of good first base prospects right now, but even if there were guys who were maybe a little bit more highly regarded, you know, obviously a, a first baseman is going to hit 280 with 20 home runs. You're not going to value that as highly as a third baseman or a, an That's outfielder right. who can do that. So you do kind of kind of take those things into consideration when you're looking at guys. You know, a, a classic example is Wilmer Flores. Wilmer Flores can hit. Um, I'm kind of sky I chuckle when the I think the Mets have announced plans they're going to try him some more at shortstop. He's got no shot to play shortstop. and I don't think he's got any shot to really even play second base, and I think third base is a stretch. He just doesn't have much agility at all. And, but I, get, I hear from Mets fans all the time, you know, why don't you like Wilmer Flores? He's really young, and he, and he hits and he a lot. Hit, right? And he does, but in my mind, Wilmer Flores might have to play first base, and he doesn't really fit that defensive profile, um, and, and so it hurts his prospect value. So you, you definitely have to look at that and look at the big picture. So being a Twins fan and them having uh, a bunch of prospects coming up and not completely terrible people in front of them, who do you see getting voted off the island in a sense, uh, either the starters or the prospects in the near future? Well, I think it's some mix. I mean, I know the Twins have some hope for Trevor Plouffe and Miguel Sano just had Tommy John surgery, but Miguel Sano is ready. Trevor Plouffe's going somewhere else, whether it's a utility guy or, or another team. And, you know, I know they like, you know, they, they gave Aaron Hicks a shot probably before he was ready last year. I know they still like Aaron Hicks, but Aaron Hicks is moving to an outfield corner when Byron Buxton's ready. Uh, you know, Alex Meyer, when he's ready, he's going to push a guy aside. So it's not, I don't think their major leaguers are that strong where it's really that much of a dilemma. I mean, they're, they're top, top prospects. You know, when Cole Stewart's ready, they're not going to say, oh, we've got five pretty good starters. They're, they're going to push someone out of the way. So I, I think... A more a general answer to your question is I think it's going to be the prospects who carry the day that, that their guys are going to get a shot. I really like Jorge Polanco too. Um, he's another one. But, but when those guys are ready, I don't think there's too many roadblocks in front of them at the big league level. Yeah, it's not like they've had this, you know, string of success lately where <laughs> the guys that they have there are like, oh, we got to, um, you know, it was interesting. Uh, you know, the one guy that is sort of really difficult to figure out is, is Josmel Pinto. Um, who kind of came out of nowhere uh, in terms of what he did offensively, and then suddenly like, well, maybe he's an everyday catcher, yet they went out and signed a catcher. So clearly they are not 100% convinced, but I think even with him, um, if he shows that he's ready, then the veteran they sign will get pushed to more of a backup role and he'll take over. But John, didn't uh, Terry Ryan kind of answer that by going out and signing some free agent pitchers instead, including Phil Hughes? That they just didn't have enough pro prospects coming and a left well, the, 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 the only level. right the only pitching prospect they have at the top of the system Alex um, is Alex Meyer um, and you know Phil Hughes is, is fine um, and, and still relatively young but that's not going to keep Alex Meyer from hitting that rotation when they feel he's ready. Uh, beyond Matt Laporta, uh, which prospect has disappointed you the most, and what caused them to uh, stumble? <laughs> Who, who's the big Matt Laporta fan? Yeah, which one of us was the most disappointed in Matt Laporta? <laughs> I, I mean, was. You were. Yeah. 
Um, Chris Lebansky, 2003 first round pick of the Kansas City Royals. Um, and he was uh, a Northeast kid, um, sort of the same kind of deal as, as Mike Trout, except not good. Um, <laughs> But, you know, it was, it was an interesting thing because when he was in high school, he was a kid who uh, he was tall and lanky, had speed, and it looked like he was kind of going to be a top-of-the-order speed guy. And then as he sort of made his way through the royal system slowly, he kind of became less of a speed guy and developed more power and then just stalled out, and he's out of baseball now and never played a, a minute of Major League Baseball. I'll give you another one, and that's Dustin Ackley up until now. Where has Dustin Ackley been? You know, he's a high school batting champion hits off the wrong foot, and this is his year. If Dustin Ackley does not turn it around this year, and he did in the second half last year, then I think his position is in trouble. So he's one that, but all those Montgomery, the, all those pitchers for the, for the uh, uh, Kansas City Royals, they all blew up. So that's, what, four or five guys that we can look at that really never made it. So... I guess my point was being a high draft pick does not guarantee success. And, and it, clearly, Matt Laporta is the poster boy for me. Because guess where I saw him pit, play the most recently? In the Arizona League this summer on rehab. Well, Montero, too, uh, the catcher in, in the same organization. Montero, yeah. Yeah, he, the Yankees put a lot of effort into him. He never developed as a catcher. And they made the trade from hell right now with him for Pineda. Pineda still hasn't pitched in the major leagues, and they're hoping they're going to do it, you know, this year and maybe make the rotation. But so far, both of those guys have been huge busts. I think every team can boast of their misses. Of There's always miss. Jim, you got you have a favorite? Yeah, I was going to say the two guys who, who jumped to mind for me. Montero's a good one because I didn't think they're. I, I never thought he was a catcher, but I didn't think he was going to hit. But the the two guys who jumped to mind for me were Sean Burrows, who. Oh yeah. Great swing, hitting the minors. I mean, the question, you know, the scouts always tell you, you know, power's the last tool to develop. And it never developed for him. And he got to the big leagues, and pitchers just pounded him, and he, and he couldn't adjust. And, and I thought he, I never, th I would have thought he would have had a longer career. And the other guy is Ruben Rivera, who, when he was in the minors, looked like he was going to be this five tool, can't miss type of guy. And I don't think his makeup was real strong. I think that worked against him. But I mean, from a physical standpoint, he had the tools to be great, and it just didn't happen. And to it your can point, go on and on. There's a lot of them. Uh, and also to your point about the draft picks, the Padres haven't had a first-round draft pick to make the team since Kevin McReynolds back in 1980. So, I mean, sometimes uh, the picks further down in the draft are, are the ones that develop. Trevor Bauer. That's true. Trevor Bauer recently. There's a very recent case. I'm not giving up on him yet. I don't know a lot why. of people aren't, but I'm close. Yeah. <laughs> Just kind of following up on that, uh, are there organizations you think that do a better job or worse job of developing players? And do you kind of factor that in when you're looking at a guy and seeing his strengths and weaknesses? I factor it in a little bit. I mean, like, for instance, the Cardinals are doing a great job, I think, with both hitters and pitchers. The, the Rays get a lot of credit for pitchers. The Giants have done a lot of good things with pitchers. But at the same time, you know, I think talent's talent. I mean, you, you can't you, – you could put a mediocre guy in the race system and they're not going to turn him into a top pitcher. So, I mean, I take that into account maybe slightly, you know, real slightly. But you also don't know if these guys are going to get traded. When, I, when I'm evaluating prospects, I guess I'm evaluating them based on how good I think they're going to be in the long term. And these guys might get traded or, or for whatever reason leave the organization. So, I guess I'm cognizant of it, but it doesn't weigh real heavily when, I, when I'm trying to evaluate these guys. I would generally agree, and, and I think the, the teams that he brought up, you know, if, say, a young pitcher gets drafted by the Rays, I might have slightly more faith that they will know how to develop him. At the same time, you have to be a little bit careful. I mean, the Rays are often mentioned as, oh, they're so good at scouting and player development. Their last several drafts have been not good. Um, you know, when they picked at the top of the drafts, and I'm not, you know, plenty of teams missed them. You talk about the San Diego Padres, and I'm sure they'd rather you not bring up Matt Bush's name, but um, and and the and the Rays did a very good job at, at those at those drafts. But when they started having success and picking at the bottom, uh, you know, of the first round, 
they started getting a little more conservative. I actually was pleased last year they kind of went back to being a little more aggressive and went after some, some younger guys. But, uh, you know, Richie Schaefer, Mikey Matuk, uh, you know, those are some of the, the guys that they've taken with that first pick the last couple of years. And, they, you know, that system is not what it used to be. So you have to be careful. It's like, they, you know, oh, they're great at scouting and development. And, you know, and it, it's all cyclical in a lot of ways. So you have to be careful of sort of painting with too broad of a brush. But in contrast, uh, haven't they been great at trading their major league players for other people's prospects and having them develop? Right. Yes, and right. getting really good value. Right. You, you're absolutely right. So their pro scouting department deserves a lot of credit as well, and that's kept them afloat, right? Because without Will Myers and, and maybe Joe, uh, Jake Odorizzi this year to, to an extent, uh, you'd be looking at a, a system that had not really produced a whole lot over the last few years. And see, one of the things that we sometimes forget is that we think when a draft choice is named that everybody's behind it and it's a unanimous pick and all the Rays staff loves this guy. You have no idea what the wars are like inside those rooms when you have two or three guys that are available and these three guys are pulling for this guy and these three guys are pulling for this guy and the scouting director is pulling for this guy and the general manager has to come in and make peace. You know, so these are not unanimous decisions. There's wars that go on. There's jobs that are lost. That are jobs that are won. It's a very, very tough process. We have time for one last question. Um, what's your take on uh, Mookie Betts this year? He really burst onto the scene and seems like a guy that's very athletic and has a lot of talent. We you, all like him. We all like him. Yeah. Mookie Betts is probably one of the most athletic kids I saw in the Arizona Fall League. Unfortunately, he's playing behind Dustin Pedroia. But as I wrote in my column last week on the Red Sox, you know, when you can play, they'll find a place for you. Or they'll trade him. You know, I mean, that's the other option. I mean, you some know, some I'd, place. I'd, right. I'd like, to see, I'd like to see him get some time at shortstop. Uh, there was some talk about uh, that being a possibility. Um, and he might be, you know, he might have the uh, athleticism needed. The arm might be a little bit short, but uh, I, I wouldn't mind seeing that just to see for right now. It's not like he's going to be ready for the big leagues right away, but, uh, yeah, we're all fans of his. Jim, Jim is like the president of the Mookie Betts fan club. I think he's the best second base prospect in baseball right now. <laughs> I, I think he's, I don't think there's any question he's got the best tools of any second base prospect, and when we were talking about evaluating prospects, I mean, he's what you want to see. He's got great tools, and he had a great performance last he's an year. Athlete. So it's, it's yeah. hard to quibble with any of that. Guys, uh, before we close, why don't you give everybody your Twitter addresses? You can find me at Bernie Pleskoff. Very simple. And I will answer any questions that you write to me, time permitting. At Bernie Pleskoff, I welcome you as followers. I, uh, I'm at Jonathan Mayo B3. And I'm at Jim Callis, MLB. And I'm Boomski, at Boomski, B-O-O-M-S-K-I-E. Don't ask why. Mm. Thank you very much for coming. Thanks.